Well, officially, good morning and welcome to Webinar Wednesday with Food Focus. My name is Linda Jackson and it's so great to have you with us today and uh, to be chatting to you. Hi there. Um, hoping you're having a really good Wednesday and uh, that the week's been a really good one so far. And hey, we're nearly halfway through, um, so that's always good news. It's always a privilege for me to be able to be on this side I'm hosting a webinar and it's great to be working with the Dairy Standard Agency for webinar number six in this amazing series. It's been such a success. Um, it's so good to see how many people really are valuing this incredible information that's been shared so generously by the Dairy Standard Agency. Let's get into today, shall we? So just a couple of pointers as to how you and I can communicate and if you are having any issues, um, how we can resolve those issues. So, if you can't hear me, please, I know this is a funny one, but please read the screen because uh, it's probably on your side, um, which means we need to check if your speakers are on and your volume is term, turned up. Um, I've also popped into the chat. If you are experiencing any technical difficulties, please log off and log on again, that normally resolves it, and I'll be communicating via the chat um, to people that may be struggling. Um, if you want to see us bigger or smaller, that's up to you. You can maximize or minimize the size of the windows so that you can either see the person big or the presentation big. I'd go with the presentation, just so you don't miss um, any of the very important information. Okay, so how to use GoToWebinar? Well, you should have seen that there's a little menu bar um, and the all important arrow shows or hides your control manner, your control panel. Um, so if you lose it for some reason, just look for the little blue circle, um, which should be at the bottom and you'll then pick up the menu. And if you click on the arrow, it'll open up your options. So what's important is um, we can, you are currently in, um, uh, mute, so you can't speak um, until the end of the presentation if you would like to, but for the most part, we normally use the question bar. Um, you can definitely see handouts um, at the end of the day if there's anything that is attached. In this case, there isn't, but there will be a certificate that will be coming to you, and then there's obviously the important question field. So please, during the presentation, jot down your questions so that we can make sure that we can pose them to Rihanna and to Jacqueline at the end of the presentation. Please use the question bar, um, not the chat function for your questions, um, because what happens is they're all collated at the end of the webinar and that information is sent through to Jacqueline so that she can answer the questions that we may run out of time. Um, and she'll definitely get back to you. She can see who's asked the question and also what the details of the question are. So please use that um, because that way it's all captured. Um, into a report. So again, as I said, it gives me great pleasure to thank the Dairy Standard Agency for their support, um, for working with Food Focus. It's been such a pleasure to partner with them on this incredibly successful um, series. And so we're very excited that today is webinar number six. Um, what is the topic for today? Well, you signed up because you wanted to understand all about the testing programs that are in place to ensure and to understand the quality and the safety of the milk on our shelves. How does the monitoring process take place at the Dairy Standard Agency? What laboratory tests are done? How does the laboratory function? Um, and what happens to the results um, to show your true colors when it comes to um, the quality of the milk that you are producing? Um, and how the Dairy Standard Agency would work together with local law enforcement, uh, environmental health practitioners to make sure that unsafe product is being taken care of and removed from shelves should it be needed. Necessary. But you don't want to hear from me, you want to hear from these two amazing speakers that I have with me today. So I have Rihanna Erlank and I have Jacqueline Rudendahl and they're going to be chatting to you today about this particular topic. And so to get us going, I'm going to ask Rihanna if she'll join us um, online uh, today. Thank you, Rihanna. It's so good to have you. It's the very first time Rihanna's worked with us on a webinar. And so it's so cool to have her. Thank you very much for being with us. And before I hand the screen over to her, I'd like to tell you a little bit about this amazing lady. 
she's a microbiologist and uh, she's been doing microbiology for a very, very long time. She decided micro wasn't enough. She needed to know more about the food industry. So she did another qualification in food technology. She's worked in a number of different capacities. First of all, she tried her hand at research at the Agricultural Research Council, where she first decided she wanted to know more about the meat side of the cow. Um, and uh, she first devoted a lot of her career to understanding meat microbiology. She then was appointed as head of the food micro lab at the ARC. She then decided she wanted to know a different part of the cow. So she moved to Lacto Lab. Um, and Miriam Nutri-Sciences when they bought out Lacto Lab, and in 2018 she moved to the Dairy Standard Agency to head up and to assist with the development of the laboratory, and I know she's been there since, and I know it's been a really, really exciting journey for her, and I have to tell you, she has the most amazing lab and some really, really cool toys um, that I don't know how to work, but she definitely does. And so, Rihanna, it's so good to have you with us today. So I'm going to hand over to you, and we really are looking forward to your presentation. Um, so thank you so much um, for being with us and for sharing your knowledge today. It's over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Linda, for the nice introduction. Um, Welcome everybody. I hope that you will find this um, introduction on the analytical methods very interesting. Uh, I would like to, sh to tell you just what the laboratory tests are that is done by the DSA Laboratory Services for the National Monitoring Program. Oops. Um, I just want to start with sample reception. I think about a month ago we did a webinar on sampling where there were many aspects of sampling hand, um, touched on, especially the, the way that samples are taken and the, the way that samples are kept. In this case, when we find when we receive samples, samples are kept on ice and sample temperatures locked with a temperature logger and an electronic temperature logger. The samples were then booked in and placed in the fridge for testing. Samples are tested usually within two hours of receipt, often quicker. The samples, if for any reason the samples were not um, monitored with an ele electronic logger, the sample temperature can also be taken by infrared. A thermometer. I think we're all familiar with this now since COVID. You get this thing stuck in your face every time you walk, you walk in a shop. So we use this as well to use to, to take temperature of the samples. Uh, as soon as the samples are received from the fridge, all packed samples are weighed and then prepared for the microbiological testing. Microbiological testing is done first for obvious reasons. We cannot um, contaminate the samples, so obviously we have to do those samples first. So the microbiological testing that we do in this laboratory is an automated tempo system. The test that we do on the milk is total coliforms, E. coli, and total aerobic count. The automated system is based on the most probable number technique. It's a very easy system, and there's much less human, um, any human interaction there, so there's much less chance of contamination. And you'll also see, when I go through these slides, you'll see how easy it is to use. And also the counting, because as some of you may know, that counting microbiological plates are really a challenge sometimes, and this makes it very easy. The microbiological testing system works like this. The sample of the um, media comes in little screw cap bottles. The bottles need to be rehydrated with water. Um, it depends on the type of test. Sometimes it's three milliliters, other times it's 3.9 milliliters. Then you have a little card that is called the reading card. This card is the card that is filled with the sample. Sample needs to be diluted 10 to minus 1, which is a 1 in 9 milliliter, 1 milliliter of sample in 9 milliliter of buffer pectone, or whichever diluent you use. Um, the sample is then added to the hydrated uh, media bottle. The bottle is then, the sample is then, um, Oh, first, you have to put the, you have to put the card into the little bottle. The bottle is then put into a filler. The filler fills 
the sample from the bottle into this little cart. You can see on the second photo, the cart there is, um, is there, there's like a little tube in from the bottle into the cart. The cart then gets filled in the filler. And in the last picture, you'll see how the filler actually cuts off the little tube from the bottle. And then you sit only with the cart. The cart is then put into a reading rack. The reading rack is incubated with all the cards in at different temperatures, 30 degrees and 37 degrees respectively, um, for 24 hours. It depends on what tests you're doing, obviously. And the results are then read with an automatic reader. The results are reported as the colony forming units per milliliter. The next test that we do is the phosphatase test. Also, you'll remember, I think it was about two, two months ago, we had a whole presentation about um, the pasteurization of milk and the efficiency of the pasteurization. This test is then exactly what we do. We test to see if the pasteurization of the milk was effective using the phosphatesimo strip. So the strip is just dipped into the milk. The strip is then um, incubated in a little bag for an hour at 36 degrees Celsius. And as soon as there is a color change, it means that there is still alkaline phosphatase left in the milk. And that means that the milk was either inefficiently pasteurized or not, not pasteurized at all. You can see from the picture that I've got there, it's a very dark yellow. So it means that this milk was not pasteurized at all. All um, phosphatase positive tests, or well, which would in effect then be raw milk sample, uh, samples, I mean, uh, are then tested for contagious abortion, which is um, caused by the bacteria Brucella abortus. The test that we do to detect this is the milk ring test, also called the MRT test. This test is outsourced to the ARC, the Agricultural Research Council, the Amherst Report um, Institute, as it may only be performed by an authorized veterinary technologist. The results takes about seven to 14 days. The next test is the detection of the inhibitory substances. The test with that we use at DSA Lab Services is the COPAN test. The well contains spores of Bacillus stereosomophilus and a fermentable sugar and a pH indicator. You can see there on the picture, that's what the test looks like um, before any of the milk samples are added. To do the test, you add 0.1 milliliter of your sample. You incubate at 64 degrees for three hours and then if there is no inhibitors in the substance, uh, in the milk, the, um, the bacteria will be able to grow and then it will ferment the sugar and it will cause um, the pH indicator to change to yellow. So a yellow coloration means that the samples, that the uh, um, test is negative. So that means that there's no inhibitory substances in the test, in the milk. And when there is inhibitory substance in the milk, Obviously, the color will change, it will stay blue. The next test is the freezing point test. This test is done with a cryoscope. Two milliliters of sample is super cool to below its freezing point. The thermostat probe determines the freezing point to the nearest 0 0.001 degrees Celsius. And the added value, the, the, Sorry, I forgot to tell you that this test, the freezing point test, is done to check for the added water in a sample. The added water value is then read off a table. This can also be done by calculation. There is a calculation from the ISO method. There is a calculation that can be done to determine this um, added water percentage. The determination um, of this test is, is done like this. There's a little you use a little cryoscope sample, you add two milliliter of milk to, this, to the um, tube. The tube is inserted into the instrument. The instrument is then switched on. The, the head of the instrument goes down into the sample. The sample is then supercooled and a reading is given. The next test that we do is the milk composition test using the milk CERN instrument. This is infrared technology that's used in this um, test. The parameters that we look for is fat, protein, lactose, and solids, non-fat. 
The instrument is calibrated monthly with different um, milks. We use raw milk, fresh rice milk, UHG milk, and also skim milk. And also daily controls are done to see that the, test, that the instrument does not um, drift and it gives you reliable results. Um, this we were also talking about last month in the sampling webinar. The samples, I think um, it was mentioned that sample bottles should not be filled too full as it is then difficult to shake or to, to mix the sample in the, in the bottle. So the milk samples for this test is heated to 40 degrees Celsius for 15 minutes and it's then gently but properly mixed. So the sample is just turned um, up and down, uh, turned around for a few times and the sample must ideally not be shaken so that there is um, air incorporated in the sample. The measurement takes about a minute and it's reported as a percentage. Um, this is also important that you take a proper sample this, for this test because if a sample, if you take from a bulk tank and the tank is not stirred, then obviously you're just going to, if especially it's taken from the top, you take just the fat and it doesn't give you the correct answer. So that's why the sampling um, webinar that was presented the previous month is so important. As the sample, the results that you get is only as good as the sample that you take. All observations are documented as soon as they are made. For the automated instruments, the instrument um, can export the results directly to our laptops. Other observations, obviously, like the um, antibiotics or the inhibitory substances, you have to um, make it and write it down. And all these observations is, is all, um, made or documented as soon as they are made. The laboratory reports the results within 48 hours of testing. Thank you for your attention. Jacqueline will now assist you with the interpretation of your results. Thanks, Rihanna. That was really interesting. And I told you she's got all these amazing toys. Did you see them? I mean, it just, I think, would make most people in the laboratory jealous, uh, Rihanna. So uh, thank you so much for that. Don't go anywhere because we're going to be coming back to you with some questions a little bit later. Um, so thank you very much for your presentation. It now gives me great pleasure to hand over to Jacqueline. So Jackie, thank you so much for, um, for being with us today. Um, I really do appreciate it and it's just been so good uh, to be able to work with you on these, um, on these projects. Jacqueline um, has a BSc um, in Food Science and Technology from the University of Tux. Um, she first started training. She loves to train people and I think that's one of the reasons why this has been so successful, Jackie, because you've been able to train lots and lots of people through a black box. Um, she then moved uh, to sensory yeah. assignment. She moved yeah. to yeah. Um, and she's done a whole bunch of things um, before eventually landing up at SAMPRO and um, then moving across to the Dairy Standard Agency where she's the technical manager. And here she's been able to focus on her passion, which is information, communication and education programs. So Jackie, we're looking forward to how you are going to educate and communicate with us today about the interpretation of these results. Uh, so over to you. Thank you very much, Jacqueline. Jax, why don't you unmute yourself, please? Right, I think I'm now unmuted. Can you hear me, Linda? Jax, you're live. Apologies for muting you. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you so much uh, for the introduction. Good morning, everyone. It's great to be here today, to be part of, of uh, Wednesday webinars. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity. Uh, thank you, Rihanna. Now that we know all the basic principles of the test performed, uh, our next step is to find out what to do with the results. Okay, right. Uh, you have seen, whenever you get a result of DSA, that we are using color coding on the result sheets of the National Monitoring Program. 
And the colors, the reason why we use the colors is just to make it easier to identify the non-conformances, but also to see the conformances. Uh, it's always good to see the good points and it gives us hope to get to a result sheet where everything is green. Um, well, you'll see that the, for the, the 10 tests performed, that you'll get a coded result for each test. And at the end, you'll see at the far right hand side of the result sheet, there's also a color coding uh, indicating the conformance of the entire the, the sample in a whole. Um, to me, the, the color coding works like a traffic light. Whenever you see red, you know, stop, there is a problem. The product does not comply with legal specification and action is absolutely needed to rectify the problem. When these are orange, well, normally orange traffic light means wait. <laughs> so it is a borderline. It should give you a warning sign. Something is not really according to uh, the conformance. It's not conforming and we need to have a look at it in, and investigate because you do not want the results to go from orange to red. And the green means go. Product complies with legal specification and everything is in order. And that's what we want. We want all the results to be green. We also categorize the non-conformances in two categories, a category A and B. Where the category A is the critical non-conformance, and maybe you've seen it on your result sheet and the email that was sent to you indicating you have a critical non-conformance. This means it's the category A indicating either a food safety risk, consumer fraud and or forgery. And the test associated with this category A non-conformance is the addition of water, inhibitory substances, a positive BM test, a positive phosphatase test, mass and E. coli. Category B non-conformances will give you an indication of uh, possible quality problems. And the test involved there is coli, total plate count, fat, protein and solids non-fat. So just to give you an idea, if we state in your result sheet that it is a critical, it means that either one of the, the, the category A um, tests were uh, tested a, a non-conformance. I'm going to discuss the, the tests in the order that you are going to see it on your result sheet, just to make it uh, easier to, to go back to it. Added water, it is against the law to add any water to milk. So the specification is 0% uh, added water. Um, the, the possible causes that can lead to uh, added water is deliberate addition. Uh, unfortunately, this happens. Uh, theft and filling up with water to mask, um, the, mask it, or addition of water to increase the volume and to get a higher payment. So absolutely unwanted. <laughs> um, and then also a negative or inadequate pipeline slope will give a piling up of water that might end up in the product and also testing uh, positive for water. Incomplete draining, this we get quite a lot. For example, clusters at on the farm, clusters prior to milking, the bulk tank, coolers, releases, milk pumps, cup removers, uh, a milk line, all equipment in the processing facility. If it was not completely drained, the water might end up um, in the product. Unintentional addition. That is, for example, if there's a chasing or sweeping uh, through with water at the end of milking, uh, it might end up in the product. Uh, addition during CIP, and this is also now on the farm or where there's a tank, accidental onset of the automatic uh, CIP system before the bulk tank is emptied. Uh, for the pipeline or the pipeline is diverted, then you'll get uh, water there's a possibility of water going into the product. And poor practices, where people are careless, uh, dipping of clusters between the milking of the cows 
um, yeah, and also if the first milk on the farm is included in the bulk milk, um, then it will uh, give a positive for water. So that's just an indication of possible causes. There might be others, but just to, to give you some idea. Inhibitory substances, as uh, 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 Rihanna said, it must be absent, it must taste negative. Um, possible reasons when there's more than one inhibitory substance, but mostly when we get this result, we focus on antibiotics. And the reasons why the antibiotics can end up in the milk is maybe due to not withholding the milk from the bulk tank. When the cows um, like have mastitis and treated with antibiotics, uh, the farm is not allowed to use that milk. It should not go into the bulk tank. And so that the cows should be clearly identified and separately milk, absolutely separate, separate uh, bucket system or separate um, uh, uh, milk loss, but it should not go into the bulk tank. And sometimes this does not happen for various reasons. Uh, maybe there was not good communication between the, the milker and the person uh, issuing the, the uh, antibiotics. Um, it's all about communication. So uh, the farmer needs to really make sure that the antibiotics doesn't um, end, up, end up in the, the final product. Uh, poor other preparation. Uh, if the cows are treated with antibiotic ointments and it's not properly uh, cleaned, the antibiotics might end up in the milk. Uh, feeding of medicated feeds. Um, recently purchased, purchased cows where you are not aware of an antibiotic treatment and also maybe the using of different uh, treatments. Then there's a chance of the antibiotics end up um, ending up in the milk. Um, as I've said, we focus on antibiotics, but there can also be other inhibitory substances that's in the milk. For example, um, sanitizers and tea dips, uh, iodine. Um, and the reason for that is that the people um, maybe not use the correct concentration, the recommended concentrations of the sanitizers, and then you'll get a problem. And also, preservatives that's been added wrongfully to the milk um, will also be tested positive under inhibitory substances. Right, if we go to phosphatase, Rihanna told us that it is only done on the pasteurized milk and not on raw milk. Um, the specification is that it should test negative. So the moment it tests positive, it can gives us, uh, give us an indication that something went wrong with pasteurization. So maybe there was the wrong time temperature combination. You know that the correct combinations is for a continuous process. It should be 72 to 75 degrees for 15 seconds. And if you are using the batch process, it should be higher than 66 degrees for 13 minutes. So if something went wrong with that combination, you'll get a um, a, a pos positive phosphatase test. Too large a volume of milk sent through the pasteurizer, uh, faulty heat treatment equipment, for example, if there's not a flow diversion valve, um, that can maybe be a reason. Uh, holes in the pasteurizing plate, uh, then you'll get the mixing of raw milk and pasteurized milk. Um, when raw milk was added to the pasteurized milk to increase volume, then the phosphatase test will be positive. And also if milk is not really pasteurized as indicated, um, we'll pick it up. Uh, so if a milk shop, for instance, state that they are pa uh, selling pasteurized milk, but in fact is not doing that, we'll pick it up with a phosphatase test. And also a faulty thermometer can, uh, can also lead to a positive phosphatase test. The BM test, as Rihanna said, is only done on raw milk. So can you see the importance why it should really clearly be identified on the processing form, whether the sample is pasteurized or raw milk? Otherwise, if we get it and it's not correctly indicated, we are going to do the, the wrong test and it's absolutely a waste of, of time and money. 
So the beam test is done, it should test negative. You know that the uh, brucella is a pathogen that can be carried from the milk to human beings. So we do not want that in the milk. Uh, reasons, uh, sometimes when we send out the, the beam test, the, the, the clients come back and say, yes, but I have not bought new cattle. So it's impossible to get a beam positive result. But there are actually more reasons why the beam test can, can test positive. The first one is absolutely purchasing new animals and you know do not know the beam status. Um, but otherwise also neighboring farms with cows, other livestock or game can be a reason. Um, late vaccination of the herd the moving of animals to other areas can be an, a, a reason, or the use of contaminated equipment can absolutely be a reason. Um, in case of a positive beam test, the state vet must be notified to examine the herd and investigate the matter. And if you would like to, to hear about more, get more information on the beam, you are more than welcome to listen to our webinar recording um, from Dr. Alicia Kluter. Um, there you get more uh, detailed information. Good mass. We're only testing here, well, we determine the mass of the um, packed products, not of bulk products. And a possible cause can be maybe that there was a fault with the packaging equipment. Um, maybe it can also be deliberate, but we really wish that it's not deliberate um, underfilling of, of product. When we go to E. coli, you know that E. coli is a pathogen meaning it's a microorganism that can cause illness. And it's also an indicator of fecal contamination, either from the cow or from human beings. Um, absolutely unwanted and therefore the specification, it should be negative, it should be absent in one milliliter. Reasons, possible reasons is poor personal hygiene when people are not washing and sanitizing hands. Um, poor milking practices where the udders are not thoroughly clean. You can get from the fecal matter going into the product of oh, absolutely unwanted. Poor water quality can be a reason. Poor packaging um, that you'll find in the case where there's an E. coli positive, but with a negative phosphatase. It tells us that the contamination took place after an effective pasteurization, so that can a, a possible reason can be uh, during the packing process. And also poor cleaning and sanitizing programs. Coliform bacteria are also the indicators of poor hygiene practices. Specifications, they should be less or equal to 10 CFU per milliliter. That's the specification. So if it's higher than the specification, possible reasons can be poor personal hygiene, improper cleaning and sanitizing of the equipment, uh, maybe using substandard cleaning chemicals, uh, not adhering to the instructions of the chemical supplier, not following all the steps, uh, all can be reasons. Improper maintenance of equipment, um, poor water quality, uh, ineffective pasteurization or post pasteurization contamination uh, um, during packaging. Um, and also, as I've said, contaminated packaging material will, can lead to a um, coli out of spec. Next one is TPC. TPC stands for total plate count. Our specification is less than or equal to 50,000 CFUs per milliliter. Whenever we see this, it gives us an indication of improper cleaning and sanitizing of equipment, uh, again, lack of maintenance of equipment, uh, improper cooling of milk. You know that it's crucial to maintain the cold chain at all stages from the milking part up until it goes to the consumer. Um, and if the cold chain is broken, you can get a, a too high total plate count. Um, Yes, uh, poor raw milk quality, uh, improper udder preparation, poor animal health, 
poor pasteurization that you'll pick up with a phosphate taste test, but also poor water quality can give us, well, possible reasons for a total plate count being out of spec. When we go to the butterfat, in 2016, the butterfat specification was altered to also include a medium fat category. That was in Regulation 260. But since then, Regulation 260 was replaced with Regulation 1510, in which you'll find the butterfat specification, as you'll see on the slide. High fat is higher than 4.5. Full fat is higher than 3.3, but up to 4.5. Medium fat is higher than 1.5 up to 3.3. Low fat is higher than 0 0.5 to 1.5. And if you have fat 3, it's less than uh, 0.5%. So that's the new specifications um, to, to adhere to. Possible causes um, can be incorrect uh, classification. We get it that um, sometimes we test the milk and it has a quite a, a high fat value, um, like higher than 4.5, but now it's indicated as full cream milk. Then it will give you a red, it's not within the classification, then it should be classified as a high fat. So the incorrect classification will give you an out of spec um, result. Animal feed, the nutrition of the animal, um, the fat of, of the animal feed will have an influence also on the fat of the, the milk. And insufficient stirring, for example, um, especially the raw milk, um, which has not been pasteurized or homogenized, if it's in, in a tank, um, the fatty part will go to the top. Um, and if there's insufficient stirring and the sample is taken at the bottom, it will indicate a too low fat content. So proper stirring is important for sample taking, but also for the customer. Um, the tank should really be thoroughly stirred because at the end of the day, the consumer also wants to have the fat inside the milk. Protein. Specification is a minimum of 3%. Possible causes can be the animal nutrition, animal feed will have a direct uh, imp uh, impact on the protein of the milk. Just get this. All right, solids. Solids non fat, SNF stands for solids non fat, and that includes the lactose, the protein, and the minerals of the milk. Um, for full cream milk, milk the minimum is 8.3%, and if it's lower than that, it can give, give us an indication of the addition of water. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you so much, and we are here to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you so much, Jacqueline. Um, lots and lots of very, very valuable information there, and I have to say, I think it's predominantly around, um, for me anyway, it's so what went wrong? It's all very well to know that something's wrong, but I think what's really cool is the fact that you have provided a, a list of um, opportunities um, for me to go and try and find the root cause of the problem. And I think that's that's really, really great. Um, and, and uh, you know, something that we should take note of as a regulator or as a, a processor. Okay, so let's have a bit of a chat, ladies. Why don't you switch your webcams on so we can all see one another and uh, we can ask uh, some of the questions that have been put forward by the delegates. Um, I'd really appreciate that. Thanks, Rihanna. Thank you, Jacqueline, um, for, uh, for being with us. Okay, so a couple of points, if, um, if I can. Um, Rihanna, you made reference uh, to several of the previous webinars which we've conducted, which I think is really great. And just a point um, for everybody who's online who may not have attend attended the Brusilla webinar or the pasteurization webinar where we discussed the phosphatase test in detail, don't panic. The recordings are available and you can find those on foodfocus.co.za under resources and webinars. You'll find all the previous webinars. And um, for those of you that were asking as to whether or not today's webinar will be available and what about the slides, 
definitely you'll find all of that information in the same place. So you can go back and either refresh your memory or catch up if you missed out and you weren't with us, which is really sad. And make sure you don't miss um, anything more um, coming forward. First of all, I'd like to ask um, Jackie a question or perhaps Rihanna, what happens or who gets the reports? Where do the reports actually go to? Right. Um, first of all, the reports go to the environmental health practitioners because they mm -hmm. took the sample, so they get the results back. And also from DSA's side, we also make contact with the uh, clients and also convey the information, the results sheets. Okay. So I think that's important because it's, you know, although this is part of a statutory monitoring program where you're working very closely with the environmental health practitioner, it's also to benefit the processor um, to make sure that they are fixing the problem before the EHP even gets to the door. Am I correct? Yes. And also from the EHP side, they can also advise the people, you know, giving the result sheets back and also advising to, to get up to speak. Absolutely, absolutely. Because ultimately the point of this is to ensure that we as South Africans are protected um, and we're also not misled by what we're buying on the shelves um, in terms of the quality and, as you said, the safety um, of, the, of the product. So let's start with some of the questions that have come in from the EHP specifically. So in the city of Charney, they have a system where they're recording all the results um, and it allows uh, or it forces them to put in whether or not the sample has passed or failed based on the analysis. Now, what do we do with this borderline orange? Um, you know, because Jackie, you said yourself it is borderline, but it is an indicator that something could be going wrong. So is that a fail or would that be too strict if we looked at it from an, uh, you know, from a, a regulatory perspective? What's your opinion? Well, my opinion is that it's not per se a fail but it's a great warning. And whenever I communicate it to the, the clients, I always tell them, don't feel relaxed if you get an orange. It's not good. Um, so you need to go and do an investigation, but it's not at the phase of it being already out of spec, um, totally and a problem. Yeah, absolutely. But I think if you've got two oranges successively, then no. that should definitely indicate that there hasn't been appropriate corrective action taken and I think I yes. probably now side with the um, you know the EHP in this regard and that that's now becoming a fail you know the first one oopsie but the second mm. orange consecutively now we've got a problem and we need to go and then investigate that problem because it can very easily yes. become a red okay all right and the next question relates to um well, just a clarification in terms of what the specifications are that you're testing the milk against um and so here if, if this is a stupid question i'm sorry jackie i just need to make sure i understand as I, there are two regulations that relate to the parameters that are essential for safe and quality products uh, milk products in south africa mm -hmm. so the one regulation falls under the Department of Health, am I correct? That's regulation one triple five? Yes. And that deals with the microbiological aspects, is, is that correct? That's correct. All right, and then we have the quality aspects where you spoke about the butter fat and you spoke about some of that information changing. And I think this is quite important because this is a recent change. We always relied on regulation 260 from the Department of Agriculture, but you mentioned that regulation 1510 came into effect in 2019, and then it actually became enforced in August of 2020. Am I correct? You're correct, yes. All right, okay, so I think this is really important for us because if we kind of so used to using 260, there was a change, the change did happen during COVID, you know, we may have been focusing on a few other things um, in terms of, you know, environmental health, but we need to make sure that we're now re referencing the correct piece of legislation. And that's obviously the, 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 the specification. So, so thanks for that. I just wanted to make sure I didn't mm. misunderstand um, yes. what, what you said. Okay, Jack, so now the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Rihanna, how is it looking out there? I mean, 
you know, from a color rainbow perspective, if you had to take the analysis that we're doing, are we looking very green or are we looking very red? Just in general, in terms of the work that's being done. No names, no name and shame. Just kind of like, you know, what's the palette of the day? Um, well, in most cases, well, good is uh, green is uh, yeah the, the overall color. Um, okay. But to me, at this stage, um, our problem area remains the raw milk. Um, yes. So <laughs> where yeah. there's red, it's most of the times it's the raw side, and especially with E. coli contamination. Um, oh, it's up and down. People selling the raw milk. We have good, good uh, sections, and other times it's really uh, a problem. So uh, the raw milk is is still a problem area. Mm -hmm. And what you're saying, Rihanna? What 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 do you find? Same thing. Yes, I agree with that. Yes, um, but in general, it doesn't look that bad. Um, okay. All right. Well, that's good. <laughs> so, so I can still continue um, milk, but but I think the issue around raw milk, I mean, we had a whole webinar discussing why it's not a good idea to, eat, to drink raw milk um, because of, you know, some of the concerns that you're raising in terms of the bottom line is the you know, in many cases, the product is simply unsafe for human consumption. And, and it's not a practice that we should in any way encourage. That was what I got out of the webinar that we did on, yes. you know, on, on raw milk. Am I correct, Jackie? Yes, you are correct. Um, but the, there's quite sentimental around raw milk, the drinking mm -hmm. of raw milk. Um, so we, I think we are going to go with this raw milk versus partial milk for some time still. Um, but it's strongly advisable to to only drink the uh, partial milk, and we can see then the results. And uh, I know that the people, well, especially from the farmer side, they really do their best if they're selling the raw milk to mm. do everything right and to get the E. coli out of the milk. But it mm. tends to still um, mm. come up from time to time. Yeah, absolutely, because I suppose, you know, the step that we've relied on for, you know, generations to make the product safer, the kill step is 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 the step that's missing. So, yeah. so we can we can manage the other factors, but we're actually not in control because we really don't have that critical control point which allows us to be in control from a from a food safety perspective. Okay, so just a couple of in, in, uh, clarification aspects. Um, when it comes to the cows being treated by antibiotics, I, I mean, it's inevitable. We're going to land up with a cow, several cows that are now, um, you know, ill and they have to be treated. What, what's the general rule of thumb when it comes to the withdrawal period? Because, you know, when it comes to inhibitory substances, how, how would you sort of handle that if, you, if you're picking up problems? You know, what, what should the farmer be doing when it comes to administering the antibiotics and then waiting and not selling that milk? What's the rule of thumb in terms of the period of withdrawal? Um, yes, well, it depends on the type of antibiotics, but normally rule of thumb is after the last treatment, um, the milk can only be used like 72 hours after the last treatment. Then the milk can go in back into the, um, the bulk tank. But that's just the rule of thumb. It depends on the type of antibiotics. So there should be clear instruction and um, good communication. I find that sometimes it's not good communicated. Um, people should know, the people that's doing the milking should know about the treatments and uh, there should be records in place. Um, and also the information of the antibiotics should be yes. good communicated to everyone working at the milk shed. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Because I think you've got decision makers and you know who are maybe dealing directly with the vet, but the yes. people that are actually the milk doing the milking don't actually get involved in those conversations. Yeah. You know, I let PT and cook um, and discussing yeah. the cow health, so they then don't know yeah. what the, what's actually happening as far as the health is concerned. Okay, so I think that's that's important to note. It's at least seventy two hours after the last dose and that's how I understood you. Um, yes. so that, that question is coming from Simla. Thanks Simla. Uh, another question and again it comes back to this 1510 versus 1555. Okay so in terms of the um, the butterfat issue. Okay so, so now we have the, the the problem is 
who's visiting the farm, who's monitoring the, 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 the milk, who the results are going to, and the split responsibility. And, and so I think this is this can be a real challenge. And, and, and Simla's highlighting it again in terms of, you know, if as an EHP, I'm going out to the farm because something's been, you know, flagged for the safety of the milk, I'm able to use 1555 as the guidance document and legally I have the responsibility for that regulation. Mm. What, but if there's a problem with the butter fat, that doesn't actually fall under my jurisdiction because that's regulation 1510, am I right? Yes. Because um, that's uh, the agriculture. Yes. I believe, um, well, I'm not sure about the jurisdiction. Um, uh, I don't know how to answer that one, Linda. Yeah. Yeah, so I think this is where you've got actually got two legal entities because the Department of Agriculture or 1510 falls under the Agricultural Product Standards Act, which is under mm. Delrad's responsibility, and you've got 1555 that falls under the, uh, the Foodstuffs Act, which is then the responsibility mm. of the EHPs. So I think it can be a bit of a, you know, this is a, it can be a bit of a challenge. Um, to the EHP because actually if they it's not really something that they are legally able to to enforce although we don't want that product on the shelf now let's ask the EHPs this is because this is an interesting question that maybe there's a legal angle what does the foodstuffs act itself say regarding the adulteration of food products because are we not looking at it from that perspective? Because okay, so if the butter fat's too high and the product's incorrectly labeled, um, you know, we're selling a low fat product, but it's got too much butter fat. Well, well that's mm. one thing. But if we're diluting the, the milk with water and we're selling the customer full fat milk, but actually it's low fat milk, would that not fall under adulteration in terms of, um, you know, the, the, the Foodstuffs Act? Is there not an angle there that would allow us still to make comments? I'm asking EHPs now, huh? I'm not an EHP. You guys would know the law better than us. So, um, but this is an interesting one. Maybe we need to pick up yes. on this discussion and, uh, and, and come back to everyone with an answer, Jackie. Absolutely. Full beans. Okay, so I think that's, uh, that, that's important. All right, so when it comes to the colors again, you know, the, the rainbow, Rihanna, mm -hmm. how much water adding is um, is happening out there, you know, in a terms lot. of a lot? Did you say, no, is that? Not a lot. No, not, no, a, not, lot. not no. a lot. Not a lot. Okay, that's, we're very happy about that. And, and um, <laughs> Loella is also very happy about that. And then what about the whole discussion regarding um, you know, RBST or other hormones that are used to increase the yield. Um, that's not currently, is I, I don't know, is that part of the legal framework in terms of the specification? Is it part of something that you're testing or possibly looking at in the future? No, not at the moment. Um, I'm, I'm not sure about the, the legal part of it, but yes, no, we are not looking at that. We are, we are looking at aflatoxin, maybe oh, yeah. test aflatoxin yeah. as well, yes, but yeah. it's not something that we're doing at the moment. Yeah. Yeah, no, perfect, perfect. Yeah, I think that's a, I think that's a, that, I think that's a really good one um, because I think it isn't a bit of an area which is possibly overlooked um, and yes. definitely looking at what I'm reading about what's happening around the world. I think that's a good one to to start adding. Okay, last questions. The root causes, Jacqueline. When you send the report out, I mean, mm. is that information? Is that like? Is that on the report, you know, where you suggest to the EHP that these are the areas where they could assist the client or is that sent directly to the client or do I just need to go study those slides so I know where I should look for the root cause? Um, well, we are now doing this webinar to give that information to the to the EHPs and otherwise we go to the clients. We have a remedial action program 
where we take the result sheets, go to a client once a year for, for all the clients, and we discuss the result sheets, um, explaining to them. And we also have, uh, well, email communication with clients. Uh, if they come back and they say, oh, help us, and then we give uh, in detail information on each test, what the specifications, and where to look for the problem. So that is communicated directly with the clients. Excellent. So it's not just about marking the exam paper, it's also making sure that I pass the test the next time, which I think is just so amazing about the work that the Dairy Standard Agency uh, do. Okay, well, there's some comments here. People are saying, wow, this is really great. Thank you so much for this information. Thank you for the webinars. Um, and um, I think we all agree, we're looking forward to the next one. So Rihanna, Jacqueline, thank you so much for being with us today. Everybody out there, all 119 of you, thank you so much for being with us today. Thanks for attending the series. I know for many of you, you should start collecting loyalty points. You've been coming to all of them, which is just amazing. <laughs> and I'm sure Jacqueline has got like a prize lined up for, you know, the person who we'll, came we'll to have a look. the webinars. <laughs> Don't you think, Jacqueline, I think that will be fun. What do you say we do? Look at yours. We must look into that. <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely. Well, everybody, thank you so much for being with us on Webinar Wednesday. And um, we would uh, encourage you to look on to look at the website um, if you want to find the recording. Um, and also look out for an email that will come to your mailbox um, with your certificate of attendance. If it doesn't come by Friday, please look in your spam folder. Okay, this is important because it will go out and it goes out to everyone who's attended the webinar, not everyone who registered. You actually had to be here to get a certificate of attendance, but the certificate will come out. If you can't find it, please check your spam folder because it's an automated email, so it will go to everybody who actually attended today's webinar. So thank you so much. We look forward to having you at the next one. Rihanna, Jacqueline, well done, and we look forward to working with you on the next webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Keep well. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody.